In Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, and today's topic is murder. Uh, there are many ways to murder someone. Because the topic is murder, I thought, I'm going to look into this. Uh, you don't always get the opportunity to speak on murder right from the pulpit, but I love the fact that we go through the Bible, and as we go through the Bible, all these topics come up. That's why I love the Calvary Chapel style. Just go through the Bible and what comes up, we'll deal with it. Nothing set up, nothing on purpose to offend anyone, but people still get offended because the truth is offensive. And so we're going to talk about murder. And I started looking up the word murder on Google, and it's amazing how many ways there is to kill someone. It's just pretty amazing. And I almost felt like writing some of these descriptions, but I think it would be too inappropriate for a Sunday morning. But I thought of... Uh, some of the the lists that I did read were like chemical reactions that someone literally dug into that and figured out how can I create a chemical reaction in someone that could literally kill that person or some sort of lethal injection or I like this one uh, the most it was funny is throwing someone out of a helicopter while you're flying up in the air Oops, accident. We don't know how it happened. We were just turning and boom, they fell out of the helicopter. And of course, the ultimate one would be the crucifixion, right? The ultimate murder, really, the ultimate murder. And all of these we know are wrong. I'm not going to get into it any more than that. The question is, have you ever murdered somebody? Have you ever murdered somebody? That's the question. And what is your answer? Don't, don't tell me your answer. Don't scream it out because we don't want to know because there's no statute of limitation on murder and you'll be convicted in the court if you admit to murdering someone. Now, uh, something the Lord just laid on my heart. Let, let's go back to Genesis real quick. Genesis chapter 4, verse 8. And I, I want to just sh- uh, share with you the first murder that took place. Uh, we all know that first murder was Cain and Abel, right? Between Cain and Abel. And an interesting little story there with Cain and Abel. Uh, We know that Cain killed his brother. And in Genesis chapter 4, it says, Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. The word kill is not the appropriate word to use here. Uh, the appropriate word would be murder. There is a difference between the two. Cain wasn't defending himself. He literally plotted the murder of his brother. And so it was an intent to murder him. Where killing can be in a defense, which would be okay to defend yourself and to kill someone if they were attacking you with a knife or a gun or some sort of weapon. And then you defend yourself and you kill them. That act. Here, Cain literally murdered him. Now, when you go to um, Hebrews chapter 11, I'm going to toss you around a little bit here, so really quickly. Hebrews chapter 11, we see the reason why Cain killed his brother. It said, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, though which he obtained witness uh, that he was righteous. God testifying of his gift and thought it was, or thought that it, he being dead, shall speak, though he being dead shall speak. So Abel's gift was more righteous than Cain, and Cain became angry at Abel's offering to the Lord that God would receive his and not his own. And so that was the reason for Cain murdering his brother. Now, this is interesting. If you turn to 1 John chapter 3, Verse 12 says, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. So John here uses the correct word. But then he associates him with the wicked one, that is Satan. And so like Satan, who is a murderer and a liar, Cain became associated with him by murdering his brothers. And it says in John, because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. The works of Cain, the work of his hand, the tilling of the ground, the preparing of his offering to the Lord was all of his own works. And John tells us that was evil. That was evil. Abel's work, which was a lamb unto God, which he required as a sacrifice, was accepted and righteous before God. And then we come to Jude, the last reference to Cain. 
And Jude talks about men who creep into the church and how they try to divide the church and so forth. And Jude says in verse 11, Woe to them, to those men who come to destroy, to come to divide, and not come to build and, and to help. For they have gone in the way of Cain. They have gone in the way of Cain. And we end there with those scriptures. They've gone in the way of Cain. And many men have gone in the way of Cain since. There have been many murders throughout history. Now we can just think of so many. Hitler being one that it just comes to mind who murdered millions and millions of Jews and non-Jews too, African Americans and, and, and others, just millions of people without any thought or intent. Definitely someone that was associated with the evil one. Uh, because he lifted himself up uh, much higher. So let's, let's talk about murder this morning. Now we left off last week uh, where Jesus was talking to us about not coming to destroy the law and the prophets, but he came to fulfill the law. And so he brought grace to us. We're not under the law. We're under grace now, and so the fulfillment of the law is grace. And we live under grace before the Lord Jesus Christ because we cannot keep the law and we cannot fulfill the law, and so we live day by day by grace. Because if you look at the Ten Commandments, we have broken every one of them, and to this day we still break every one of them. Our hearts are not fully committed to the Lord at all times, 24-7. And so we live under grace. Thank you, Lord, that you forgive me when I do mess up. Thank you when I do not keep the Sabbath day. Thank you, Lord, when I dishonor my father and mother, that there's still grace there for me. And then Jesus opens up a new section here that runs really from verse 21 all the way through 48 because he's going to now give us an example of how he's fulfilled the law and how we have failed in keeping the law. Now, once Jesus had made it clear that he's not destroying the law itself, but fulfilling it, he shows us how inadequate the law is for us. It really is. And so in verses 21 through 26, Jesus tells us what they of old said about the law, the Old Testament, those old prophets, uh, those old teachers, even the Pharisees and the religious leaders who described the law to the people. What did they say about the law? And then he tells us what he says about the law. And then he ends with a couple of illustrations for us to, to uh, contemplate. So my theme this morning is, I'm so angry, I can kill someone. You ever feel like that? I've asked some of the youth there. I said, you ever hear that phrase? They're like, no. You ever feel that way? You know, I'm so angry. Yeah, I could kill someone, yeah. You ever get to the point where someone frustrates you so much that, that you just want to kill them or you wish they were dead, in, in a sense? And yet, that phrase is so true. It is true to the point where Jesus is going to get to the heart of the issue of what murder begins, where the root of murder is. There's a point in everyone's life when one is is really frustrated or annoyed by a person that he has thoughts of killing him or her um, that it can even make them sick and Jesus wants to get to that issue in our lives that point in our lives where we have a hatred or a dislike for an individual because that should not be a part of our Christian walk. So let's look at the offender or the perpetrator here in verse 21. He says, You have heard that it was said of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Now the word whoever murders there in the Greek is has murdered or has committed murder. So he's talking about a person who has actually done the act. And he says, you have heard those teachers in the Old Testament. And he says this phrase five times in Matthew. Matthew 21, he says there, you have heard that it was said of old. Matthew 5:27, you have heard that it was said of old. Verse 33, the same thing. 38 and 48, you have heard that it was said. And so he, he's referring back to what, the people, the teachers were saying in the Old Testament, but possibly also the Pharisees and the scribes who were interpreting the law and then giving it to the people. The people normally could not read. And so they depended on what the religious leaders were telling them. They believed them. They had to trust God that they were giving the truth. And there were basically two forms of the law. There was the written law and then there was the oral law. And if you could read, you would read the written law exactly what it said. That's why I love the Bible. We have to take what it says literally within its written form. 
And so when you go to the Old Testament, you can read the Ten Commandments exactly as they're written. But there's also an oral law. And the oral law came from the religious leaders that came to the people. And that oftentimes would change depending on the person and how much he wanted to expound on the oral law. We oftentimes give the oral law from the scriptures to expound on them so that we have a better understanding. But sometimes we can also be in error when we give the oral law. For instance, sometimes we will say, I love God and God loves me. And that's truth, and we find that in the scriptures. But oftentimes what we do orally is we know then if God loves me that he wants me happy. And so he wants me happy so I can get these things that make me happy. That's the oral law, but there's air to that. Yes, we can get these things. We can buy the house. We can buy the cars. We can have the vacations as long as we are content with what God gives us. And if he blesses us with a car, praise the Lord. Give glory to God. If he blesses us with a house, praise the Lord. Give glory to God. As long as we continue to do what he has asked us to do already, you're tithing, you're supporting the work of the Lord, you're serving in his kingdom, and he gives you everything else, that's a happy life right there, a happy life. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But it's when we say, like, like uh, uh I was watching one of these faith teachers on TV, Jesse uh, DuPont. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's kind of a comedian and a faith teacher. And this is how he manipulated the scriptures. He says, you know those people that judge us because we have a lot. I have a mansion. I have a jet. I have cars and so forth. You know, I have all these things. You know they judge us. You know why they judge us? They judge us because they don't have it. That's why they judge us. It's not because we're wrong. Because God wants to bless us and prosper us. That's what he wants to do. But they judge us because they're envy of us. They want what we have. And they can't get it because they don't have the truth. And I'm like, wow, what a manipulation of the truth. And people are like, yeah, that's right. And they eat it up. Because they want prosperity. They want wealth. They want those material things. Uh, Cirillo dollar who just got his plane he made the call out 65 million dollars for a new plane and he brought it out and there was all of these people that were complaining and 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 refuting what he was doing and so forth and he said hey this is what god told me this is what god's gonna do you watch and see he got his plane he got 65 million dollars to buy a new plane that's crazy stuff that's the oral law where they say, well, God loves me, so what does that mean? So they make up everything else. Well, he mean, he, it means I get a new $65 million plane. And then he complained and said, well, it really isn't a new plane. It's an old plane. That's the oral law, and we need to be careful with the oral law that we're interpreting the written law correctly. Jesus shows us, first of all, how they were teaching it, and then he will go on to declare what God's original intent was when he gave the law. And so Jesus here is going to reveal to us the, the uh, intent of the law. The basic difference was that they were teaching it, the law, as purely a physical thing to be worked out in a physical way so you don't murder and as long as you don't murder hey god accepts you you're fine but you can have all the hatred and envy and wickedness in your heart but that's okay you've never murdered anybody and so it's purely more of a physical thing than a heart issue where jesus will declare that god intends it to be a spiritual thing governed by spiritual by a spiritual heart which uh, with a right attitude towards men God is more interested in the attitude than in your actions, the attitude behind the actions itself. A person can be doing all kinds of noticeable things, works for the Lord in the church, but if his attitude is bad, God doesn't regard the work at all. God doesn't regard the work at all. And so we need to have the right heart when we do those things. And and that's our that is our struggle that is our objective is lord change my heart so that it matches my works so what we need is a heart like the two men who went up to the temple and prayed one was a pharisee and the other was a tax collector you know the story
And the tax collector said this, God, thank you that I'm not like the other men who are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even like that tax collector on the other side of the corner. I fast twice a week. I give in tithes of all of my possessions. Thank you, Lord. You see the attitude there? Kind of arrogant, right? Thank you, Lord, that I don't do this. Thank you, Lord, I'm not like that. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not a homosexual. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not you know, like that over there, that person. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like those faith teachers. Lord, thank you. you know, that's the attitude that these religious leaders had. But the tax, or, but the, uh, uh, tax collector who was hated among the people, and he knew that, this is what he said. He said he would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner. So he wouldn't even raise his eyes. He knew, wow, I'm wretched. Nobody loves me. I got the worst job in the world. And, and oh, pitiful me. Lord, forgive me. I am a wretched sinner. Could you somehow forgive me and give me grace, Lord? I mean, that's humility. That's understanding your position. And Jesus then qualified it by saying, I tell you that this man went down to his house justified. So there's something to be said about a person that has humility and not a person that is boasting, well, I don't do this and I don't do that and I tithe and I give this and I do that. Well, that's wonderful, but it's not your strength. It's the Lord that does it through you. That is what Jesus is trying to get to. So he says, you shall not murder here. Now he's quoting from Exodus and also Deuteronomy chapter 517. When you read those scriptures, it just says, you shall not murder. Both scriptures, that's all it says. It never talks about judgment. It never talks about anything else. It just says, you shall not murder. The next statement, he says, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Now, Jesus is giving us the law here. He's just telling you, this is what people say. And that whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. And the judgment then is immediate. So you kill someone, they, they will take you to court and they'll find you guilty and then you will be judged. So he's talking about uh, the act taking place at that moment. That's, this is what happens. This is what they say happens. We do find a reference to judgment in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1, where Moses calls all of Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today. And so he's talking about the laws. This is the laws that come from God, and these are the statutes, the laws of God, but these are the judgments or the curses that come with those laws. But he never mentions the judgment along with murder, but along with all the commandments. When you murder, there's always going to be consequences. If you get caught for murdering, you will be judged. This was the oral law that was taking place at that time. Now, Jesus gives you the purpose of this commandment. Look at verse 22. But I say to you, and that's important, because Jesus is saying to us, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. The judgment. For the religious, it was enough not to put somebody to death. That was good enough. But for Jesus, it wasn't good enough. There was more to it. He goes to the cause of murder and he includes being angry. So if you are angry, that is the cause of murder. And Jesus is trying again to get to the deeper issue of this truth. Uh, he forbids us to nourish anger in our hearts here is what he's saying. <clears throat> Look, ang uh, murder begins with anger. So don't get angry to the point that it brings you to murder. Murder lies within that anger. An unjust anger is killing in the heart. God calls us to account as much as much for the angry feelings as much as the murderous deed itself. And so you might not be a murderer, and thank God for that. But yet if you have hatred in your heart, you're just as guilty as a murderer, he's saying here. You see how the law works? Now, we're all guilty, aren't we? I don't think there's one person in this room, in this world, that has not felt anger towards somebody. That is murder, Jesus says. And that is breaking the law and the purpose of the law. So how shall we answer for this murder? The fate of an angry person is deliberately expressed here in exactly the same words that are used in verse 21. Exactly the same. 
they'll be in danger of the judgment. And since it's hard to imagine someone being judged for their hatred, you know, the intent behind it, what Jesus is talking about here, when they stand before God at the judgment, God will judge them at that point. That's the law. And if you have hatred in your heart towards anyone, when you stand before God, you will be judged. Now we as believers, because Jesus is making a statement, this is what they said, this is what I say to you, and then he's going to give us the, the, the grace that comes, and this is where we're at, the grace, because we do have hatred. And so Lord, take that hatred away. Help me to love my brothers. Help me to care about my brothers. Help me to understand my brothers so that I can remove the hatred from my heart and be right standing with you, which we can. We can do that. A long time ago, when I used to work for Southern California Edison, um, I used to have a boss that was just a racist. <clears throat> he belonged to the, um, the Masons, the religious Masons group. And usually you can tell they wear a ring. It's got a little pyramid uh, picture and it's black on it, which is a Masons group. And it is a very racist group uh, in, in many of those uh, groups there. And he just had it out for Hispanics and for African Americans. So he was always constantly on them and harassing them. Well, I developed a hatred for him. It was easy to develop. A lot of people hated the guy. There was one point where he literally um, asked me to go home because I wasn't wearing a certain attire. And then I came back the next day, <clears throat> and I had put in my log that I went, went home the next day sick because of stress. Well, he saw that, and he then began to set me up to fire me. And so he, he asked me the next day to stay home. I mean, to stay in, in the office, not to go out, and that he was going to take me to the doctors because he made an appointment for me. And he goes, and I don't want you driving. I'll drive you there myself. And this is how arrogant the guy was. And so he drove me to the doctors, the company doctor, and he was going to get down to the point of this job. This is what he said. If this job is giving you stress, we'll find another job for you, or you can leave the company. And so I went to the doctors and I sat down with him and, you know, he asked me all these questions, I guess, that somehow lets him know if I'm really stressing or not. Well, this guy was, I guess, uh, known for this. And so the doctor says, you don't have stress. I go, I know I don't have stress. He's the one is giving me stress. He goes, exactly. And he says, and I want to, I want to congratulate you for standing up to him because no one really stands up to the guy. You know, so I went back. I walked back, actually, because he drove me and left me there. And so I had to walk all the way back, which was across uh, from the yard there on, on um, what's the street? Uh, River, Riverside that goes up to Pep or Pepper, Pepper Street. And it's an office over there. And, and I, I went into the office, and I started getting ready to go work. And he comes up. He says, what did the doctor say? And I said, oh, he said, I don't have stress. He goes, What? Hang on there. And he went back and he called up the doctor and so forth. So I, I developed this hatred for the guy. I really did. When I heard Jesus speaking about this hatred, he was the first person that came to mind because I've never hated anybody as much as I hated him. And I realized at that moment that I was in judgment by God. That if I were to stand before him, I would be judged. It didn't matter what the guy did to me. I had a hatred for him. I had murdered him in my heart so many times. I, I literally thought about me and another guy that, that, that were being harassed. We thought about uh, the, the, the cocktails with the kerosene and lighting them and throwing them through his windows. We thought about doing that. Literally, we sat in the living room. How can we do this without getting caught? That's how much hatred I had for this guy. <clears throat> and when the Lord revealed to me that my heart was wicked and evil, and I was just like Cain. I knew that I was going to hell and rightly being judged. No matter what he did, I had that hatred for him. And then when I realized that Jesus came and died on the cross and took my place, and he took the guilt of that hatred, boy, that was just such a weight that was taken off of me. I was no longer guilty. I was set free. And you know what happened next? God gave me a love for him. God gave me a love for this man that I hated so much. And now I, I, I continue to do my job, and when he harassed me, I'm like, hey, come on over here. Look what I'm doing. Hey, I'm willing to show you, you know? And if he told me to do something, I just did it. To the point where one day he called me in a year or two later, and he said, said to me, I, I want to I commend you. You've changed. I'm like, no, Jesus changed me. He goes, oh, <clears throat> oh Jesus, oh, okay. Well, that's good for you. I go, no, it's good for you too. And I witnessed him. 
And he just like backed off and like, okay, well, I just want to let you know you've changed and I'm really impressed by the change attitude and so forth. And, you know, and I just kept witnessing to him. He gave me a love for him. And I realized, and, I, and I've taken this principle for myself throughout life, that when any time someone comes at me or accuses me, you know, of various things, I understand they don't understand. They don't know. They really don't know what's going on. And I feel more sorry for them than hatred for them. Uh, because I understand where they're at and I understand the the perspective that they have and and from where they're coming to attack. They're not coming from a biblical perspective. They're not coming from a spiritual perspective. They're coming from the flesh. And I understand that now. And so I can just say, okay, you're wrong. That's not true. But that's how you feel. And that's okay. And I still love you. And and I'm not going to have a hatred towards you. Will I trust you? Probably not. Probably not. I mean, that's understandable too. But the hatred is gone. And Jesus is the only one that can take that hatred away. So he says, if you hate, but there's more. Look at the next statement. And whoever says to his brother, Raka. Now the word brother there, his brother, he's talking about humanity here. Not necessarily just the Jewish brother, not just the Christian brother, but all of humanity. Anybody from the president of the United States all the way down to the guy that sweeps the streets. Any of your brother, if you call him Raka, now the, the, the precise meaning of Raka is uncertain. We really don't know. Some will give us a, a, a certain definition of it because it's just not a clear expression uh, to us, but it does represent contempt and possibly anger towards someone else in, in a form of language. And the Lord goes back to, again, the attitude of, of murder which is anger, and anger will motivate us to call our brothers raka. Um, some have said it means empty, so you call it, you're just empty, or, or, or you're good for nothing. Uh, you're worthless, in a sense. I was told that growing up by my father. I love my father, but that was something that he struggled with. He couldn't express himself to me, and so when I did things wrong, he just says, you're worthless, you know, you're worthless. And I'm like, okay, so I'm, I guess I'm worthless. And that's how I view myself because of what he would always tell me. Be careful what you say to your children. Don't ever tell them that they're worthless. I, I made sure that I never told my kids they were worthless or that they were stupid. Never said that to them because they aren't. Nobody's stupid. They might be uneducated and they need to, you know, educate themselves, but they're not stupid. Nobody's that and nobody's worthless. God doesn't want us to put down the value of an individual here. And that's what Jesus is saying. Why are you calling somebody that I created Raka? These are my children. Now, as children as far as the world, the humanity, but not all are his spiritual children. But I created them, and yet you're calling them Raka? Because who are you? You didn't create them. I created them. And what you're doing is you're killing their reputation. And usually that's done out of anger because you're frustrated and angry at that individual. Therefore, he says in the next statement, they shall be in danger of the council. That is the Sanhedrin there. They will be coming before the priests, the elders, the scribes, and the high priests, just like Jesus uh, came. Uh, You'll be in judgment. Again, they'll judge you. Uh, I, I think for us today, what it's saying is when you're a person that does that, people will look at you and they have certain judgments of you. You're not a loving Christian. You're not a Christian that respects humanity, life itself, uh, values, and so forth. Even though they're wrong, even though they may be wicked people and evil, why are you calling them raka? Or Jesus adds, whoever says fool, which is the third form of murder here, you fool. And fool means idiot. That's what the word fool means here. You're an idiot. He's an idiot. Well, he's not an idiot. (laughs) He might be evil in allowing the enemy to use him, or he might not even understand that he's being used, but he's not an idiot in the eyes of God. God loves even the wicked. The Bible talks about how he is sad because the wicked perish. That's God's heart. So he says, you shall be in danger of hellfire for the person that says, you idiot. Hellfire. One commentator said, the person who is angry enough to utter this derogatory word is guilty enough to go to hell of fire. 
James talks about the tongue is a fire of iniquity. And then he talks about it sets on fire. It's set on fire by hell itself. And so you align yourself with that group when you begin to use those words. The proper sentence for all of these crimes is judgment of hell which no human court is able to impose upon you. But again, once again, God alone will, will be that judge. Let me define hell for you. After the introduction of the worship of fiery gods in the Old Testament by Ahaz, the Jews would sacrifice their children on Moloch there in Gehenna, uh, in, the, in the valley of the uh, Kedon, Kedon, and they would sacrifice their children there. Well, he stopped it, and he said that will not happen again, but it became a place of refuge. It became a place where they would throw the criminals after they died, the carcasses of animals and, and so forth, and so it was constantly on fire. And when Jesus uses the, the words where the, the gnashing of the teeth, where the worm uh, will not die and the fire will not be quenched, he, that was an example of what hell itself would be like. And that's the word that Jesus is using here for those that call their brothers idiots or fools or raka. Because murder begins in the heart. Let me lighten it up because this is pretty serious. <laughs> a preacher was becoming terribly distracted by a man who came to church every Sunday and he happened to fall asleep every Sunday morning. And so the preacher decided that he was going to play a little trick on the guy and so the uh, preacher said everyone who wants to go to heaven stand up so the whole congregation stands up except the guy so he sat them all down and then the preacher said everyone who wants to go to hell stand up and the guy jumps up and he's standing up he looks around he says i don't know what we're voting on pastor but i guess you and me are the only ones standing here Pay attention. <laughs> uh, we don't want to go to hell. Um, again, this is, this is condemning, isn't it? We've broken the law. Each one of us are guilty. Uh, I remember being as a Christian how the phrase, you fool, started. You know, and that became very popular. You fool, you fool, you're a fool. And I'm like, oh boy, that's not what Jesus said to do. And so like people going around, hey, you a fool. You know, hey, bro, you fool. Like, man, that's not what Jesus wants us to be doing. You know, we're here to value life itself. Now, now that we understand that we're guilty, and at this point you're going, wow, uh, I am evil <laughs> i have broken the law you know i haven't kept what god's intent of the law was because jesus said this is what i say to you that if you call your brother those or have that heart that you're just as guilty as a murder itself and at this point you go well where's the hope well the hope is in jesus and so jesus goes on and talks about the offended or the victim and, and what happens when we offend that person or that victim and how we need to be careful, the ones that are wrong. He says, therefore, verse 23, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. So the word offering there in the, in the verb is talking about a sacrificial offering. And so you're taking the lamb or the wheat or whatever type of offering, you're literally bringing it up to the altar to give unto the Lord. That's the picture you're bringing a holy act. You're, you're, you're reverencing the Lord and you're giving it unto God. And then all of a sudden, you remember that you called somebody fool or you called somebody raka. And so the picture is you've done something against your brother. Now what that something is, it, it, it doesn't really tell us. It could be anything. Uh, legitimate complaint. Now this is a complaint by the other, the one that's been offended uh, you may not even be aware of it, and yet he has been offended by you, and you come aware of it. You drop your offering right at that point, and you go to that person, and you seek out reconciliation. Look at verse 24. Leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift to the Lord. So leave your gift Right there. And that's a sharp command that Jesus is giving here. It's a sharp command. You should leave your gift at that moment and go get right with your brother. It's urgent. 
You can't worship me with that heart. It's the wrong heart. We should be doing that every morning. Lord, forgive me for my sins as I come to you and worship. Let me worship you with the right heart, Lord. I remember uh, years ago, uh, and I've shared this story before, and it's one that I share because it's so real to me when it happened and it just brought to light what Jesus said here, is I had offended one of my sons when they were little. I had judged him inappropriately, and it was right before church. <clears throat> and so he went off angry at me, and I went in to church to worship the Lord. And he went up to class, and I went into church. And as I was sitting there and we were worshiping, that scripture came to mind. You have someone that has something against you. And I'm trying to worship, and that scripture just kept coming to mind. And finally I realized, it's my son. So I got out of my chair, I went to the classroom, asked the teacher if he could come out, and I apologized to him. And then he went back, and we hugged, of course, and kissed. And, and then he went back into class, and then I went back down, and I worshiped just fine. That's what Jesus is talking about, making it right before uh, one another, finding a peace. So he says, first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer the gift. First thing, which speaks of time, right? You have to do it immediately. You have to take care of the situation. And then Jesus adds the urgency of this uh, reconciliation. He says, agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him. At least your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hands you over or hand over into custody into the officer and you be thrown into the prison. What's taking place here is that, that normally you didn't send the police out to get somebody. That wasn't the custom. They didn't have police available like they do today. No, you actually went to the person. If they've done something to hurt you or harm you, you actually had to grab them and say, we're going to court right now. And what Jesus says, while you've got them, while you're together and you're headed to court, you guys need to work it out. Work it out. Let it be reasonable. Bring about peace. Otherwise, when they hand you over to the judge or the officer, then that officer is going to hand you to the judge and then you'll be thrown into prison. And while you're in prison, if you have owed this person something and, and, and you need to repay them, you won't be able to repay them because you can't work in prison. You can't make resources to pay the guy. So guess what? You'll be in prison for a long time. And so the consequences of not working out is worse than trying to work it out. It's always better to work out things than let things go. That's the attitude that we should have as believers. Work it out or go home and fest up. If you get all festered up and all riled up and then you're going around moody and angry all the time, that is sin. And you have to stop that. You have to forgive you have to let it go, and you have to let Christ rule and reign in your life. This is what I do when I'm in those situations, and being a pastor, I'm in them quite often. When people disagree or don't like the way things are, are being handled uh, and so forth, or, or change happens, even in change itself. I was expecting some people going, why did you get rid of the flowers? Why did you get rid of the plants? You know, and someone's saying something, because we don't always agree on everything, and that's understandable. And so in those situations, I try to explain myself the best that I can, and I'm not always the best at it. And oftentimes I get misunderstood. It's more of judgmental than anything else. And it's not that I'm judgmental. I'm just trying to explain how it works. For instance, in ministry, and we've had these situations happen all the time where people come in and they want to change the ministry right away. And I understand uh, the purpose of that because they want growth. They want to see something different, something fresh. I understand that. But we can't just go in and say, see you later, let's move. You know, there's people that are there. There's human beings that have invested time and effort and, and they're connected and so forth. And for us to just discard them and move on is, is too insulting. We have to take our time. We have to wait on the Lord. We have to slowly let God move in the hearts and lives of people. You just can't come in and start a, all these accusations. There's got to be love mixed in there. But then you explain that to the person, oh, you're just quenching the Holy Spirit. Okay. That's not the attitude that a Christian should have. Oh, well, now you're judging me. Okay. So the point is that we're done because we can't reason. We can't find that peace. And so you need to just forgive and you just need to move on. 
Then he says, Surely I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. So as I said, if you're in jail, there's not much more you can do. You're stuck. So work it out. Let me close. <clears throat> you know that the murder rate in the United States is roughly about 10,000 per year. And that's not including abortions, just the murder rate itself. More than one per hour every day of the year, someone gets murdered. That's pretty amazing. In all of the wars and nations of history, there's been 530,000 United States combats who have been killed. Since the 1900s, death from guns alone in the U.S. have totaled more than 800,000 just from guns alone. More than all the military wars combined together. For those who have committed murder, the physical act of murder, judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. Now, let me say this, though. Paul was a murderer. He approved of Stephen's murder as a non-Christian. And he was on his way to murder more Christians and imprison them. But God's grace saved him, and he was forgiven of the murders. So God can forgive you of the murders so that you don't stand before him in judgment of those physical acts. So he is a forgiving God. Uh, David Zamora and, and others uh, who have murdered people because they've been in gangs, God has forgiven them and now they're pastors of churches. God has forgiven them, wiped out their debts because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So it is available to us if we come to him. Remember the question I asked you? Have you ever committed murder? We would all say yes after this message. We've all committed murder. We all are guilty of that crime because we've hated in our hearts. And if you have hated, if you've, you've killed someone, you've killed their reputation, you're found guilty. But there is forgiveness again when we come to God and we receive his grace and ask him to change our hearts and attitude uh, towards our brothers, that we would have love for one another. As Jesus said, you fulfill the commandments when you love one another. God wants love between the body of Christ. And when he has love, then there's growth. And when there's growth, the gospel gets out and people are saved because people are looking for love. They're not looking for judgment. They're looking for love. They're not looking uh, for places to plant their feet and be lifted up. They're looking for acceptance. They're looking for connection. They want that love. They don't want to really divide. That's the enemy who's seeking to kill and destroy. So, the way out from this judgment is by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. By giving your heart to Him and letting Him change your life. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We appreciate, Father, your candidness, Lord, the clarity of it all, Lord. And I know that these scriptures are, are, are very few, but they're very powerful. And they remind us of our own hearts, Lord, that we need to check them, Lord. And I thank you for bringing it up to me, Lord, that I may continue to check my heart on these issues, Father. No matter, no matter who, uh, who my anger is directed to, Father, I have no right, Lord God, to call them idiots or, or raka or fools, Lord, or to have a hatred towards them, Lord. I can, I can dislike the sin. I can hate the evil that is taking place. Lord, but that human being needs to repent and turn to you, Lord. And we continue to pray for those, Lord, that are not in line with you, Lord, that have rebelled against you, Father, that you may bring them salvation, Father. Thank you for our salvation. We pray, Lord, again, that you would change our hearts if we have hatred or if we call people names. Lord, that we wouldn't be like that, Lord, because Jesus never did. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.